So hi everyone. Um, we're probably going to wait a few minutes for um, more people to show up uh, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. So in the meantime, while we're waiting, uh, I want to remind everyone that we had uh, an awesome event yesterday um, organized by Sam West Westwood and Nadia Solomon called the cost of crediting bad science. And all of the slides and the recordings are on YouTube at the moment, so we can go. You can go back and rewatch it if you missed it. And these are upcoming speakers for uh, July. So we have Liz Allen uh, speaking next week on um, the contrib contributor role taxonomy. So we're going to give it maybe maybe two, three more minutes, um, and then I'm going to go ahead and introduce Emily. Okay, so um, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Emily Senna, who's speaking uh, at RIOTS today. Emily is a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, specializing in the validity of clinical research. Her interests are in the use of meta research approaches to drive improvements in the validity, transparency, and reproducibility of primary research using animal models of human diseases. Her work has informed laboratory practice guidelines, editorial policy, and clinical trials design. Emily is the inaugural editor-in-chief of BMJ Open Science and a convener of Camaradas. Today, she will be speaking about why preclinical research should embrace open science. So Emily's talk will be around 40 minutes. So that means that we should have around 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions. So please make sure that you do ask questions throughout the talk and we're going to push them through to the speakers. And also remember to upvote questions that you do want answered so that we, we know what the priority is. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Emily, now. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Riots for having me. It's a real honour um, to be amongst the speakers that you've had uh, in this series. Um, I've been to a few of your talks and I think all of them have been, have been great and I've learned lots of interesting things. So as Alex said, I'm going to talk um, a bit about why preclinical research should embrace open science. I will start my talks with disclosures. Um, I'm editor-in-chief of BMJ Open Science, as Alex mentioned. Um, but more importantly, I think um, it's important that I state that the work I'm going to share with you today is how I um, fund what I do, <laughs> including pay my mortgage and um, on holidays, uh, so I think it's important that I share that my self-interest. So my perspective um, in terms of open science and preclinical research is that I'm interested in animal models of human disease and or diseases, not just one disease, um, and I use meta research techniques, so mainly systematic reviews to assess the design, conduct and reporting um, of preclinical research but also to try and develop approaches to improve their rigour and transparency. The structure of my talk today is I'm going to try and explain the scale of the problem, so how the life cycle of preclinical research is not as fit for purpose as it could be, um, describe my utopia, I guess, what I'd like to see in an ideal world as a consumer of preclinical research, um, and then try and describe some potential solutions. So translational failure, what do I mean by translational failure? So this is an example that I often start my talks with um, from a systematic review that was done by colleagues in, in Australia um, some years ago now, where they identified over a thousand different interventions that have been tested in laboratory models of stroke. Over 600 of these have been tested in animal models 374 of these drugs uh, were shown to be effective in animal models of stroke. Just under 100 were taken forward to be tested in clinical trials. 
but only one intervention, uh, clot busting with thrombolysis, was shown to be effective in these clinical trials. And it's, it's probably slightly disingenuous for me to present the data like this because it's not that, you know, TPA or thrombolysis was shown to be effective in animal models and then it was taken forward to be tested in a clinical trial. It was evidence from myocardial infarction um, thrombolysis studies that led to the hypothesis to test it in stroke trials. Um, and then people went back into the animal studies um, and showed that it was effective there. And um, there are other interventions that are used clinically for stroke, but there isn't that same supporting evidence. So we came into this into this research um, with a hypothesis that in the life sciences, particularly in academia, that there are perverse incentives, things like getting our work published, things like getting funding, promotions to produce positive results with little or less attention paid to the validity of those results. And then when we talk about the use of animal models, there are additional pressures to reduce the number of animals because of the cost, time, ethical considerations, the feasibility of these studies that result in studies either being underpowered or of unknown power. And then together, these factors combine to compromise the utility of animal models and contribute to translational failure. And translational failure isn't something that just affects ischemic stroke research. We've presented evidence in um, multiple sclerosis, in models of pain, in hemorrhagic stroke, um, and in Alzheimer's disease as well. But before, or you know, despite this, this problem we have with translation from bench to bedside, there's also been discussions around issues of replicating studies, so trying to reproduce um, studies in a similar setting. Um, Examples of this um, have been demonstrated by pharmaceutical companies who've shared their historical experience of when they've tried to replicate published academic findings. Um, Bayer and Amgen um, both published um, their experience of this and showed that they were unable to replicate the majority um, of academic research that they tried to. Um, but the issue with these examples is that you know, there's a selection bias. There's two companies out of, we don't know how many, who've had this experience. Um, there's also recall bias um, in that they may be differences um, in the accuracy or completeness of recollect recollections um, of these participants in terms of their events or experiences of replication. Um, and then also one of the issues around uh, these pharmaceutical company replication reports were the details and the data underlying these attempts were not made available. And they are also um, examples of prospective replication studies um, that are academic led and there was great attention given to the faithfulness of the original study design. You know, these studies had adequate statistical power that were pre-registered. Um, but again, they were issues with replication across these different um, domains. But again, um, there's potentially a selection bias in this data set, although the details and the data behind these um, replication attempts were made available. So, you know, the, re the reproducibility crisis, I think, has been well characterised by both the lay media um, and academic um, sources. You know, these are just examples of some of the headlines that are out there describing um, how science goes wrong, um, how there's issues in the use of animal research. Um, I'm sure I'm not the first in this series to to present these data where, you know, academics were asked about how, whether they thought there was a reproducibility crisis or not. Um, but when we focus specifically on animal research, um, what we've tried to do is identify potential sources of bias in these types of studies um, and then try to characterise them. So the areas that we tend to focus on in our research are threats to the internal validity of, of a study. So that's the strength of the cause effect relationship are the effects that we see in these studies due to the interventions that we're giving the animals rather than unknown um, systemic biases. 
um, you can strengthen the internal validity of an experiment by doing things like randomization or being blinded to treatment allocation um, during the study and when you assess outcome. Um, we focus a lot on external validity. So this is the generalizability of findings um, or conclusions from one lab study to potentially another lab at different times, different species, or in the context of preclinical research to humans in a clinical setting. Um, and then we've also been focused on reporting biases, and I'll speak a bit more detail about reporting biases um, later in, in the talk. So the idea that you can usually find what you're looking for um, isn't something that's particularly novel. This is an example that I quite like from the early 60s by um, Bob Rosenthal, and he describes a graduate psychology class um, with which he conducted an experiment using a paradigm called the T-maze, which is a paradigm for um, to assess learning and memory um, using rats. Um, so in the long arm of the T-maze is where you introduce the rats. Um, you've got the dark arm that's reinforced with food, and then you've got the, la the light arm um, and essentially you assess how quickly the rat learns that by turning to the dark side it will have that reward of food um, and you randomly alternate the light and the dark sides um, to assess that. So he told his graduate class that he had two groups of rats. He had maize bright and maize dull rats that have been bred for generations to be really good at this paradigm um, or ones that have been you know, raised style rats that have been bred for generations to be really bad at this paradigm. And the students ran the experiment over five days, and for sure they found that the maize bright rats spent more time in the dark, in the dark side, um, and also learnt more quickly to go to the dark side. Of course, this wasn't an experiment of maize bright and maize dull rats. There was absolutely no difference um, in these rats. They were randomly selected from the animal house each morning. It was an assessment on the biases um, of the students themselves. When they discussed their or, you know, reported back on their experiences of handling the animals, they were only ever bitten by the maize dull rats. Um, and, you know, they described the maize bright rats as these cute, cuddly, shiny nose rats that they much preferred working with. But this concept of bias and um, how how that you know how this affects our actions isn't something that's unique to scientists. Um, I think it's a it's a human thing. Uh, I quite like this example um, describing the conductor Zubin Mehta. So Zubin Mehta is credited, um, so he was conductor of the LA Symphony and New York Philharmonic um, orchestras and is credited with saying that he just didn't think women should be in orchestra. He didn't think women had the skill set um, and certainly didn't think they had the stamina um, to perform for the periods that were required. Um, and in this graph we can see, so the y-axis here is the proportion of um, women in major US orchestras. Um, and we see that there's very few. Um, and then something happens in the 80s and we see this, this sh you know, greater increase in the number of female hires. And this is a time when they introduce blinded auditions. So you audition behind a curtain. So you know, the person selecting you didn't uh, know whether you're ma male or female, but it was really focused on the quality of your playing. And they think that blinded auditions explain roughly 30% of the increase in the female proportion of new hires at major symphony orchestras in the US. So going back to, to the science, um, we have conducted a number of systematic reviews um, looking at specific research questions in the modelling of human diseases, um, specifically stroke, motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, EAE, which is a model of uh, multiple sclerosis and glioma. Um, and we identified that very few of the studies that we included in our systematic reviews report randomization or report the blinded assessment of outcome. Um, and then when we look at the impact of this, um, 
using meta-analysis, we found that studies, so this is just one example we're looking at um, the reporting of randomization, that studies that don't report randomization report substantially larger treatment effects than studies that do. But people say, well, you know, in those examples in your systematic reviews, you're looking for reasons for translational failure. You know, I described at the beginning all these drugs that work in a lab, you know, in the animal models, and when we test them in a clinical setting, they don't work. Um, and then we're going back and doing these systematic reviews, looking at essentially what potentially could have gone wrong in those animal studies. Um, so kind of that kind of backward looking back at, you know, where things have gone wrong, potentially introduces a bias. Um, so we said, OK, instead of trying to identify reasons for translational failure, we would just randomly sample from PubMed. And we randomly, you know, we generated um, six digit random 2000 six digit I think PubMed ID has got six digits numbers um, from those 2000 looked at all the animal studies um, and then assessed them for the reporting of randomization of blinded assessment of outcome sample size calculation and reporting a conflict of interest um, this y-axis only goes up to 25 percent so we can see very few are reporting these measures to reduce risks of bias um, and then these graphs for each of these we show um, the changes over time of reporting these blinded assessment of outcome hasn't increased very much we do see a slight increase in randomization um, reporting, but reporting conflicts of interest statement is what has, in, you know, improved the most. And then people say, well, that's a random sample from PubMed. You know, PubMed has got lots of great stuff, but also there'll be lots of, of rubbish in there as well. Um, what you want to do is look at the good quality journals, and then from the good quality journals is where you will find the good quality research. So we then um, identified um, the in vivo, in vivo studies from our sample and rank them in order of increased impact factor. So these are deciles of impact factor. So up here is the high impact factor journals um, and the low impact factor journals are down here. And again, we looked at the reporting of uh, these four measures to reduce risk of bias. Um, randomization, it turns out, is less likely to be reported um, in high impact factor journals. This is, there's no difference between high and low impact factor journals um, for reporting blinding, nobody really seems to report sample size calculation, but the high impact factor journals are more likely to report a conflict of interest statement. And then people said, oh yeah, but you know, the place that you'll find the best quality research is um, in the best institutions. You know, good quality universities will produce good quality uh, research. Um, so some of you will be familiar with REF, um, which is as painful uh, exercise that we go through um, essentially looking at the so-called quality and impact um, of the research that universities produce um, and then the institutions are ranked and that determines essentially how much money they get from the government. Um, before REF was called REF it was the research assessment exercise um, and this um, assessment exercise um, was performed in 2008. And what we did is we took the top five institutions um, based on, oh sorry, my mouse has just stopped working. The top five institutions, oh, I can use a laptop mouse, um, from these five institutions um, and identified all the preclinical research that they had published um, in the following two years, so in 2009 and 2010. And we looked at the reporting of randomization, blinding, and inclusion exclusion criteria and a sample size calculation. Um, and again, the scale here only goes up to 30%. Um, so we can see that very few of the top institutions in the UK are reporting these measures to reduce bias. Um, we kept the institutions anonymized because uh, I may need to find a job in the new <laughs> at some point in the future. Um, um, but I do say that blue is a nice Scottish colour. So if we compare the reporting um, of randomization across the three data sets that I've described in the years 2009 and 10, um, we see that less than 20% of the top five institutions in the UK report randomization in their animal studies. Um, in our data set, 
from our in-house database. So these are the data that we collected in the context of systematic reviews. Um, a few more have reported it, but still not enough. But actually, we're more likely to find a randomised um, preclinical study by just randomly sampling from PubMed. Um, I also mentioned um, external validity. So this is the phenomena that we want to generalise findings from one laboratory to different settings. Um, and I'm going to speak about the standardisation fallacy. Um, you know, efforts to increase reproducibility by reducing variation by standardising, you know, the lab environment, the tests that we use, um, the genetics of the animals, um, is essentially increasing our risk of detecting effects with very low external validity. So um, we are being able to detect effects in a very narrow range um, of conditions. Um, in a condition, the reaction norm is a phenotypic expression across a range of environments. Um, so in an experiment, it's the outcome that we measure. Um, and this here depicts the reaction norm. Um, and where on the reaction norm you sample is affected by some sort of some you know, nuisance variable. So you may conduct an experiment um, that in which this nuisance variable is present and then you observe an effect here um, or another experiment um, where you know nuisance variable around here is present and you have an effect here and this appears that we failed to reproduce but actually what it could be describing is that we're sampling from different areas or different parts um, of the reaction norm. Um, we conducted a study, a simulation study, to try and um, estimate the impact um, of having multi-lab studies on reproducibility. So if we compare um, this graph here with um, this side here, the dashed line is the estimate of the true effect and the shaded area is a 95% confidence intervals for that effect size based on the sampled studies. And we can see so each of these one lab studies have conducted the same experiment um, and we can see that some of these individual studies, the 95% confidence intervals don't overlap with the true effect, which suggests an inability to reproduce or to replicate uh, these findings. When we compare it to, to this study here, uh, this sample here, where each of these individual points are the pooled effect from four laboratories, so a multi-lab study contributing to an effect, we see that all of the studies overlap with the true effect, um, suggesting better reproducibility. Um, reporting biases, so the umbrella of reporting biases, um, this is the phenomena that not all outcomes or a priori analyses are reported, um, so um, we've got publication bias, um, which is essentially where neutral or negative studies, I've underlined negative um, because I think that uh, it's, you know, un an unduly pejorative term. I think it's where you've had to accept your null hypothesis. But anyway, these studies either take longer to get published or they remain unpublished. They're therefore less likely to be identified. Um, not just in systematic reviews, but um, in decision making based on existing evidence supporting a, a phenomena. Um, or we've got selection bias. So this is the concept where lots of different analyses may be performed, but the analysis that produces that P is less than 0.05 is what is used. Um, and selective outcome reporting which I think is um, a particular issue in laboratory research where we often assess lots of different outcomes um, in an experiment, but then only the outcomes that produce that significant um, finding are the ones that end up being disseminated. Uh, for those of you um, on Twitter, I highly recommend following the hashtag um, Overly Honest Methods. There's some uh, interesting nuggets in that. So we looked at um, the presence and or the potential presence and impact of publication bias in animal models of stroke. And um, we used what's called a funnel plot. Um, so in a funnel plot, you plot 
the effect size of individual experiments on the X axis and on the Y axis, you've got the precision. So this is the inverse of the standard error. So the narrower your error bars are, the more precise the study is. Um, and what you expect when there's no publication bias is that these precise studies will lie around the true effects of an intervention. And as you become less precise in the experiment, you expect an equal distribution of both positive and negative findings. And these black dots are um, the experiments that we identified um, in our systematic reviews. Um, and we found asymmetry in our final plot. So there was a lack of imprecise negative studies um, in the data set. We then use a technique called trim and fill in which we attempt to impute these theoretically missing uh, negative studies to make the final plot more symmetrical um, and then adjust the overall effect to account for this. Um, and we saw that our overall effect reduced from 32% down to 26. Um, and we estimated that about one in six experiments remain unpublished. I want to stress that I think this is a gross underestimation um, of the magnitude of this problem. Um, lots of these negative studies, so on this side of the graph here, um, were experiments that were published in the same manuscript as positive findings. Um, in our data set, there were only 2% truly negative um, research papers that didn't have any positive um, findings in them. And, you know, if people are going to use animals in their research, um, you know, I think it's really important that those data and those findings contribute to our distillation of knowledge. So um, I've tried to kind of characterise some of the problems that we have in preclinical research. Um, so as a consumer um, of preclinical studies, um, ideally what I'd like to see, or you know, I think preclinical research would benefit from open science tools that facilitate clarity in how studies were performed, so that allows consumers to assess the robustness of the research studies, but also if required that they can replicate them. Um, tools that facilitate collaborative research. So, you know, you could conduct multi lab studies, for example, to improve the external validity of experiments. Um, tools that um, allow us to confirm that studies report what they set out to do um, so that we can, you know, minimise reporting biases or more effectively assess reporting biases. Um, and also tools that allow us to access data so they can be used and compared more efficiently. Again, to allow us to assess robustness, to support replication. You know, for me personally, I do, I do lots of systematic reviews. I can't stress the amount, of, you know, how much time I've spent with a ruler, desktop ruler um, on a graph trying to extract effect sizes from published papers. So having access um, to the underlying data would make my research uh, a lot easier. So in terms of um, some of the tools and initiatives um, that are out there, and I um, would you know, really encourage and value preclinical researchers to engage with um, things like registering study design, so protocol registries. Um, in recent years, there have been two specific animal study registries that have come about, preclinicaltrials.eu and um, the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment has also um, developed a registry that allows preclinical researchers to register their studies. Um, the Open Science Framework also supports this. Uptake um, is still not great. Um, I haven't checked the numbers recently, but you know, very few preclinical studies are registered. Um, I don't think that all preclinical studies should be registered. You know, I think there's some exploratory research that maybe aren't fit for this, but I think specifically confirmatory hypothesis testing experiments and would really benefit from um, preclinical trial registration. There's also journals now that allow you to publish your protocol so you get credit for, for that. Um, and I think those kind of platforms should should be more engaged with. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, open methods. Um, I think there's preclinical research would really benef benefit from embracing different open methods. Um, these are just some examples. Things like electronic lab notebooks. Um, 
me include, you know, some of us who are a bit more old school used to just writing things down. Um, but, you know, electronic lab notebooks allow for better access, sharing, indexing of information, um, even within a laboratory, um, especially when people leave, trying to find, you know, what a postdoc did or what a PhD student did four years ago can be very difficult um, when it's written in a book. Um, things like protocols.io, so protocols.io are an open access repository of science methods. Um, so this is where you can link in the manuscript in your publication, give details, detailed description of, you know, SOP. So very detailed description that you wouldn't necessarily have in a publication. Um, but if somebody wishes to replicate, they can access that information. Um, RRID, so resource, ident resource Identification Initiative, um, is designed to help researchers cite key resources used to produce their scientific findings. So things like citing cell lines used or antibodies used in an experiment. And again, these can be linked in protocols. So when people want to go back um, and either replicate or develop on an existing study, they can have a look at what was used in the past. Um, I've probably got a real bee in my bonnet about transparency um, in how data were generated. Um, reporting guidelines have really been at the forefront of trying to encourage researchers to be very clear in, in, in their reporting. Um, the NC3Rs um, developed the ARRIVE guidelines um, and these I think are probably the, the, the definitive reporting checklist for animal research. They've been endorsed by over a thousand different journals, but also funders, universities, learning societies. Um, they've been downloaded, you know, over a hundred thousand times. The ARRIVE guidelines have, um, I think there's 20 different kind of sections um, to guide researchers through clear and transparent reporting of their animal research. I really think we should try and embrace alternative publication formats. Um, so there'll be lots of you who are already interested in open science methods will be familiar with registered reports. Um, but for those of you who aren't as familiar with them, um, this is where you develop your idea, design your study, um, and then you submit that for peer review. So you can get feedback um, at a time where it can have the most benefit before you've actually started the experiment. You know, you can adapt the design, um, essentially the protocol before you started data collection. Um, you know, this assessment is really focused on the quality of the research question and the methods that you're going to use to answer that research question. Um, you get in principle acceptance um, at, you know, at this phase um, of the pipeline. So, you know, it changes the incentives for authors to producing positive findings or telling a nice story to, you know, the most accurate story. You then collect and analyse your data, write the report. Stage two peer review really focuses on, on your faithfulness to what you originally described you were going to do. And also that, you know, your conclusions and discussions are in line um, with what you just what you set out. Um, I had a quick look on PubMed um, yesterday and there are 832 registered reports indexed. Only 23 of those um, are animal studies, but all of these seem to be related to cancer research published in eLife. So um, are connected to the replication effort I described at the start of my talk. Um, and I really want to, you know, really want to push um, preclinical researchers, especially those who are doing confirmatory studies to engage with the registered report format. I think lockdown is a great opportunity um, for people to try this out. You know, lots of us um, are locked out of our labs, um, aren't able to, you know, to do the wet lab research that we normally do. Um, and this is a real opportunity to engage with the registered reports format, um, you know, take advantage of the community who will give you feedback on study protocols and start to make this format normative um, in the preclinical research domain. Um, allowing others to check your work, I think, is really important. Data should be available. Lots of journals have um, open data policies. There's lots of different platforms that allow you to share data. 
Unfortunately, these have generally become undocumented data dumps. There's very little quality control. Data sets are often not linked to original studies. Um, the code that has been used for analyses are often not shared, so you don't even know where to start in terms of reanalyzing. The fair data principles um, were developed to ensure that data are findable, accessible, interoperable, um, and reusable. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's more work, not just in the preclinical space, but generally to to make data um, more useful um, for, for reuse and sharing. Um, they are journals now that allow you to publish your data. So, you know, that extra effort isn't necessarily a thankless task because you get that credit and reward for doing so. Um, so, yeah, engaging with these different publication formats, I think um, hopefully should encourage preclinical researchers to engage with this a bit more. Um, I think it's really important that we know who did what. Um, I saw um, from Alex at the start that I think it's next week's talk is um, around ORCID. If there's one take home from today, um, that's an easy thing for everyone to do is to ensure that they have an ORCID ID. Um, it allows researchers to you know, get full credit for their work, um, but it's also a useful tool for other stakeholders to track and evaluate the research that we do. I'm also a big fan um, of the credit taxonomy. I think our, you know, the first last author status quo that we have um, isn't massively helpful. Um, knowing what people did to contribute to a study um, is much more useful. You know, if I decided that I wanted to reanalyze a study and I could look at all the people in the middle who have done important work to make a study, um, you know, to make a study, what you know, to make a study work efficiently, and um, being able to contact that person and say, you know, I've got this issue with your R code, or um, I'm not quite sure how to analyze this. Can you give some advice? Would be useful. Um, I did try and float the idea of, um, you know, movie star credits um, to the publisher for my journal when we started out. And um, so just instead of having that long list, because even with the credit credit taxonomy, you still have a first and last. Um, but I think maybe that idea was a bit out there, but I'm hoping that at some point we get to that point. So I've described a few tools. There's lot, you know, there's like I said, there's lots of different tools out there. Um, I really like um, this open workflow rainbow that describes all the different stages from writing a grant, you know, to sharing your code, um, to sharing preprints and you know outreach and assessment and how we can embrace different open science tools um, and methods um, to support that. I must admit they are lots and lots of different things and even as somebody who's very engaged with open science I sometimes struggle with what's the most appropriate thing to use um, you know what's the best tool out there so I think there's some work around um, making it easier for the average researcher to engage with some of these methods. So how has my research um, influenced what I do? Um, and I thought I'd quickly describe some of the policies that I've used or introduced as an editor in chief of a journal um, around the research we do um, or informed by the research that I've done. Um, so at our journal, we publish robust science irrespective of the results. We encourage replication studies, preprints, protocol sharing. Um, we publish, well, we will accept registered reports, although um, we haven't published any yet because people aren't submitting them as yet. Um, we use open peer review, well, obviously open access. Um, we publish the reviewing history. We require open data. We signed up to the top guidelines, fair data principles. We award open science framework badges for pre-registration, open methods and open data. We use the credit author um, contribution taxonomy and um, ORCID. Um, we use the resource um, identification initiative for those IDs. And we require people who are submitting animal research to submit an arrived checklist. Um, but we have focused on four items, land is four. So randomization, blinding, sample size calculation and um, reporting inclusion exclusion criteria. So benefits of open science. Um, for science, I think it um, will improve the transparency of research that's more verifiable, efficient, reproducible and sustainable. 
um, for science, for society even, sorry, it, you know, they can readily access um, and use scientific information. For researchers, there's evidence that, you know, open research has more citations, but you get more visibility, increased rigour and transparency of work, and obviously better documentation. But, you know, it's not, it would be disingenuous to say it was, there were no obstacles for researchers. Um, and I think this is mainly focused around the reward and incentive system that we have in academia. You know, there's limited emphasis of rigour in grant awards, um, in appointment panels. A lots of this work is novel and evolving. Um, and I think we have limited continued professional development opportunities as scientists. Um, that I think hamper our ability to fully engage with some of the open science methods that I think would move things forward. So I borrowed um, this from Brian Nozak, um, but I think it nicely describes where we are um, and what we need to do in terms of open open science. Um, you know, it's it's the innovators that make it possible. You know, all these different tools, ORCID ID, preprints, um, you know, protocols.iou, the innovators have made these tools possible, made it possible for us to do open science. Um, you know, once, you know, you make it easy and you get the early adopters, the people who are highly engaged. And then once it starts to become normative, I think you'll have that kind of early majority who will engage with these things. Um, until it's rewarded, um, I don't see that we'll get the majority, the late majority um, involved. Um, and it's probably once you know you make it required that policies come into place that then the laggards of people kicking and screaming, dragging their feet will finally have to also participate. Um, I've spoken about lots of different, um, I guess what we call research improvement activities, all these different tools, things that research stakeholders think will increase the usefulness and the transparency um, of research. But one of the things we need to ensure that, you know, there's lots of ideas and lots of them are theoretical, um, but we need to be able to assess whether or not these interventions, these tools can be effectively delivered um, to the community and that they have the desired effect that we're looking for. So I'm going to finish off by quickly describing a study that we did um, in collaboration with PLOS One called Icarus. Um, and this, it was a randomised controlled trial in which we assessed the impact um, of compliance, the impact of asking authors to submit an arrived checklist um, on the compliance with the guidelines. So anyone who was submitting an animal study to PLOS One was randomised to either normal editorial process or they were asked to submit an arrived checklist. Um, manuscripts then went through the process as normal um, and for the accepted manuscripts we assess compliance. I mentioned that ARRIVE has 20 items but when you operationalize those into questions, yes no questions, you end up with 101 different questions um, which we asked of the papers that were included. Um, we randomized just over 1600 manuscripts um, 1300, over 1300 went for peer review, 600 and something were accepted. So we assessed um, outcome in these, in this data here. Um, in terms of submitting a checklist of the 332 in our intervention group, 301 um, manuscripts were submitted with a checklist. There were 13 in the control group who submitted a checklist without being asked. Um, in terms of our primary outcome in the control group, there was no manuscript that had 100% compliance with ARRIVE. Um, our median compliance was 37%. Um, in the intervention group, there was no manuscript that had 100% compliance either, um, and our median compliance was 40%. So there's no distinguishable difference between um, these two groups, i.e. asking people to submit a reporting checklist didn't improve um, the quality of reporting against the guidelines. But one of the benefits of, of that study was that um, along with some other NC3R's activities, it informed an update to the ARRIVE guidelines. So ARRIVE 2 um, 
I think it's coming out next week, it's been accepted now, but it's available on BioArchive, um, which has essentially streamlined the guidelines in terms of there's a set, there's an essential part that we're going to use to focus to assess um, improvement and compliance, and then there's a more comprehensive set. So it's changed the strategy um, of trying to improve the reporting again using um, these guidelines. So key messages, um, I hope I've managed to convince you that in vivo studies which don't report simple measures to avoid bias give larger treatment effects. Um, unfortunately, most studies don't report simple measures to reduce bias. Publication and selective outcome reporting biases are important and prevalent. Um, intervention only at the reporting stage, i.e. asking for a guideline, um, a checklist compliance, um, are unlikely to have impact. You can only really find these things out by studying large numbers of studies. Um, I guess the important thing to remember is that any experimental design can be subverted, but what's important is knowing how to recognise when this has happened. Um, you know, they are lots of different tools out there to support and facilitate open science um, engagement. Although, like I said, even I sometimes get a bit confused about all these different things that are out there. Um, development and implementation of these tools um, is going to require resources. Um, I think we need to ensure that, you know, we continue to conduct research um, to determine how effective these tools are. Um, education will also help, um, including training in critical appraisal um, and CPD for researchers. But I suspect it's really reward and incentives um, that will likely drive change. Thank you very much for listening and thank you to, to our team here in Edinburgh. I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was a wonderful talk, uh, and I think it's essential that all of us, you know, I'm, I'm a clinical researcher myself, but I think it's important that we understand how bias can creep into preclinical research as well, given that it's, you know, what we build the whole foundation of science on. So thank you for that. So we have we have quite a few questions um, that have come through, so I'm going to go through them with you. Um, I do want to remind people to upvote questions that they find interesting so that we know which ones to prioritize. So the one that has the most votes that I can see um, is um, someone asking, so they said you have spoken about publication bias, but is there any evidence around citation bias that could show just how underestimated the problem is? I think you have to unmute. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> um, so that, that is a good question. I so by citation bias, I guess I'm I'm not 100% sure what you mean. I'm guessing um, you're talking about people citing their own research and those of their close friends. I'm not sure of of research in that space, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would hazard a guess that it's a definitely an issue. <laughs> um, but no, I'd, I'd struggle to give you an answer specific to that. That's right. Thank you. Uh, so the next one is um, someone said, to what extent can research ethics committees help? Uh, RECs can often be a bane to research with excessive paperwork and arbitrary rules, but can they also be a boon by protective uh, animal welfare? Can they have a net positive effect? in that regard? No, that's a really, really good question. Um, and it's something, so I sit on our, uh, our AWERB, so our Welfare Animal um, Welfare Ethics Review Board. Um, and I was asked to join the committee um, because of the perspective that I bring in terms of validity. Um, but it's not something that's, that's formal. Um, and there's been this, I, I don't, it's a status quo, I guess, that, you know, it's not the remit of an ethics committee to check for scientific rigor and validity. Um, you know, we have the three R's platform that are there to assess um, harm to the animals. Um, and but we you know we don't have a, a formalized structure to assess the likelihood of benefit. And given that in an ethics committee, the harm benefit analysis is what you do and you weigh up to decide whether or not 
a study should should be conducted or not to me it seems you know prudent that we should maybe try and formalize and have some sort of formalized benefit around the likelihood of benefit um hanno verbal um, from burn wrote a really nice paper which he called the three v's so internal external and construct validity are these three v's that we should consider alongside the three r's when we're trying to determine harm benefit um, because if a study isn't well designed the likelihood of realizing a benefit that potentially is there is limited so i think there is a role but it's something that's that isn't implemented as yet but i think they are discussions and movements in that direction brilliant thank you um one of our other listeners wanted to ask you to talk a bit more about what um, Camaradis means and saying that it's like a cool initiative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds slightly socialist, doesn't it? Um, we're comrades. So now I'm going to struggle to remember it. Um, it's the collaborative approach to meta-analysis and review of animal data from experimental studies. And essentially, we are a, a group, we know we're a loose, well, collaboration in a loose sense, there's no kind of formal um, membership requirements or anything like that. But we provide a supporting, I guess, framework and infrastructure for people who want to do systematic reviews of laboratory research. You know, systematic reviews have been around for many years and they're the, they're the norm for clinical research. Um, but it's, you know, it's in recent times, probably in the last 20 years now, 15, 20 years, that um, we camarades was established and back then nobody was doing it um, and we've tried to facilitate and support others to to do it in a kind of socialist way <laughs> right thank you um okay so this um this is a bit of a longer question so i'm just going to read it out loud but it's something that i'm actually i'm actually quite curious about this as well as an early career researcher so mm -hmm. someone said um as a postgrad student i struggle with getting others in my lab on board with open science including other students and my supervisors i try to bring it up often but no one shows any interest and don't seem very open to discussing it i even heard a fellow lab mate say they didn't blind or randomize a study as if it was the norm how can i encourage these practices without seeming pushy yeah, so this is probably the most asked question that I have that I get and I don't have necessarily the perfect answer. Um, I mean, I'm quite pushy. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm un unapologetic in, in my descriptions of the issues and the impact, you know, the evidence that we have that shows that these things are important. Um, but and, you know, I think it's important not just to to tell people that they're doing things wrong, but also provide solutions that support um, people. Um, I think one of the great things that's been happening is around more senior academics and researchers who are very much on board and um, will advocate for some of these methods. So, you know, if there's people in your institution who are more established and senior who would be willing to come and give a talk, you know, I've, I've gone to people's lab meetings and presented a lot of the stuff that I've presented now to show that, you know, these this is where we are. This is the impact of these methods, you know, that they can have on research outcomes. Um, but also these are the things that you can do. And some of these things aren't that difficult. You know, you know I think randomization and blinding are probably low hanging fruit. Um, in terms of improving the rigor of your research. So I think tapping into to networks, you know, things like the UK Reproducibility, Reproducibility Network, tapping into these resources and being connected, especially with some more senior people who can come and, and advocate and support you, um, is probably the strategy that I would take. Brilliant. Um, that, was a, that was a really, really comprehensive answer. <laughs> um, so we have two other questions that are both um, related to resources. So 
one of them which I think is is um, particularly important in the context of the um, kind of lockdown and you know not going back to um, to working in our usual environment. So someone said that uh, at their university the lab projects typically conducted as part of final assessments are not going to be possible this year for undergraduates. The plan is to get students to do literature based research projects and they're interested in introducing students to systematic reviews. So they're asking if you have any recommendations of particularly good resources or papers that would be useful for biomedical students. Um, yes, <laughs> so um, my colleagues and I have been talking about how we have become incredibly popular during lockdown. Um, it's the same in our institution. Um, so there's a couple of things. So the NT3Rs held a webinar um, that I spoke at um, giving details about you know, how you do a systematic review, why you do a systematic review based on laboratory research. Um, in that, and that is available online, I can send the link to you, Alex, and maybe, I don't know if you've got somewhere to post it. Um, that can then, that's got specific resources um, to help people. Um, Camradis has developed, um, supported by the NC3Rs, um, a platform called SURF, we like a, we like an acronym in our group, <laughs> the systematic review facility, um, which has educational resources that takes you through all the different steps of doing a systematic review, um, has got our application that allows you to conduct the systematic review, um, links to other sites and sources. Um, we so because we've had so many requests. One of the things I need to do this afternoon actually is my I need to record a voiceover over some slides um, that some colleagues and I um, are also going to make available on the SURF website that talks you through all the different, there's three 20 minute talks around the different um, steps in conducting a systematic review of laboratory research. So we are, we're trying to make additional tools, but there are tools as well, but I'll send you the link Alex and you can share that. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so the other the other question, and I guess you can you can add this when you send the resources might be might be more helpful. Uh, someone is asking if there are any registered reports templates that are specific for preclinical studies. Um, so one of the things I actually tried to do when I found out how few people had um, submitted registered reports for preclinical res research was to try and work out which journals um, submit them, uh, accept them even, um, but there's so many and no one, it's, it's not clear. Um, so in BMJ Open Science, we accept um, registered reports for preclinical research. Um, in terms of templates, so on the Open Science framework, um, there's some templates around registered reports. Um, and I think through the BMJ Open Science website as well, I think we've got some links there um, to support people doing um, a registered reports. Um, but I'm happy, you know, if someone's got specific questions, I'm happy for people to email me directly because there's so few that I don't feel like it's going to take up all of my time. Um, and like I said, I think, you know, it's going to take the early adopters to start making this normative so that we can get this um, used and engaged with more. OK, brilliant. So I think we have we have time for maybe one more question. Um, but just to to say in the meantime that um, Katie Fernandez has just commented saying that for the question regarding resources for systematic reviews, if you're a King's student or staff, please contact her uh, because they're collecting resources and training on systematic reviews. And she put in brackets, Emily, I hope it's OK if I contact you around resources and advice. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay, it's another so thing that we're trying to make normative. So the more people doing systematic reviews, I think the better. <laughs> definitely, definitely. OK, so maybe, yeah, we're approaching the hour. So let's just go with the last question. Someone said, um, do you think preclinical data sharing is becoming more commonplace? What are the main barriers researchers face with sharing this type of data? Um, so I don't. I mean, it's difficult because I, you know, I, I do live in a bubble, <laughs> so it's difficult for me to know. When I think about how much research is being conducted, I think very little is being shared. Um, the examples I gave um, of repositories are very generic, but they are lots of 
very specific repositories for different types of um, preclinical data, um, which I think I guess will facilitate facilitate that. When we were putting in place our policy at the journal around open data, you know, we spent ages saying, are there scenarios in which preclinical data shouldn't be shared? And we we struggled to come up with one. You know, when you look, you know, clinical trial data and anonymization, you know, there's complexities there. Um, but in the preclinical space, I've really struggled to to identify um, reasons not to share data. Um, and there's some great examples of people who have, you know, sharing videos from, you know, animal behavioural tests, sharing, you know, outputs from, you know, from, I don't know, looking at different types of proteins. I mean, I think yeah, there's, there's lots of different types of data and getting a format to share data. But I don't think we're in a stage now where, you know, size is really an issue anymore. You know, space is cheap now, relatively. Um, so I, I think it's just that it's not normal to do it more than anything. Um, and and I think that's probably the biggest issue rather than that there isn't the the platforms or that it's particularly difficult. But I guess, like I said, you know, what's important is that if you share it, that people know what it means and how to use it. So, you know, sharing code um, and things like that also needs to be to be included. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK, so we're probably, yeah, we're um, just past the hour now. So I just wanted to thank you once again, Emily. That was a one absolutely wonderful talk. Um, so your talk will be uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel. So I just wanted to briefly remind everyone to subscribe so they can uh, kind of stay in touch and like rewatch all their videos as well. Um, so next week we're going to have Liz Allen uh, talking about credit taxonomy. Uh, so do also remember to uh, follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with um, kind of all of our updates. And yeah, we'll see everyone next week. Thank you again, Emily. Right, thanks for having me.